When I was thinking about how to introduce Bob Pulley, I had to ask myself, how did I come to know him? Was it first as a clay artist? Was it as a lover of folk music? Or as a player of folk music? Was it our UU connection? Was it as the husband of the wonderful poet Nancy Pulley? Was it at the legendary Pulley picnic? And as I pondered all the ways I know him, I realized he is an integral part of the fabric of the community I live in and move in here in Columbus, Indiana. He and Nancy are pillars of the arts community, and they have been inspiring me as long as I've known them. I am also delighted to point out that I basically start every day with Bob. Coffee in a Bob Pulley mug, cereal in a Bob Pulley bowl, and we eat most of our meals on Bob Pulley plates. We also have Bob Pulley woodcuts on the wall. He's everywhere. My paths have crossed with Bob's in many ways over the years, and I always appreciate the thoughtful conversations I have with him. I relate to his sensibility about living on the land, about having raised his kids in the country, about appreciating nature. He is one of the most thoughtful people that I know, and I appreciate his authenticity, his commitment to his art, his love of the physical world, and his love of his family, and his commitment to UUCCI. I'm honored to call on my friend, and I look forward to his spiritual journey. A snakeskin curls by the front door, papery as the life I outgrew here, Easy to see the falling of this house, the shattering of skies into hard sparks of window glass, puzzling the dust, sills stripped of their skins and bloating. It is dangerous to come back, to see young memories swim naked in the pond, silvery as Maxfield Parish nymphs. A peacock blue skink runs then stops to sun upon the faded siding. When I try to catch the time I stayed here, my thought freezes to the pump handle or sticks halfway into the wood, a rusty ax. I remember I played more music then. Today, the wind moves meadow grass in waves and another of my skins slips behind me. At the end of the lake is a black cove, and in that cove is an orange fire. The fire waits at evening, when clouds still take the disappeared sun and scatter it, salmon on water, the quivers a liquid silver. Someone is out in a wooden boat, watching trees slip by like dreams in the wavy mirror of water where the mussel fishes leap and the circles of their movement go around the boat, the lake, and the circles reach the pines, a dark bristling wave of pines surging with hushed sea sounds. Someone's wild and coming home on the slapping, lapping water, parting cattails with their small boat, stepping on the shore in darkness. Someone warms their hands at evening in the air above the campfire. Everything is dancing shadows when the figure, blurred and shifting, settles down into the sweet grass. And a heron, gray wings open, lifts up from the clinging shallows. You are the new day. I will love you more than me and more than yesterday. If you can but prove to me you are the new day. Send the sun in time for dawn. Let the birds all hail. Life will urge me say You are the new day 
When I lay me down at night, knowing we must pay for toker that this night might stay yesterday. Thoughts that we as human soul could slow worlds and end. One more day when time is running out for everyone Like a breath I knew would come, I reach for a new day Hope is my philosophy, just needs days in to be love of life means hope for me born on a new day you are the new day and before we start i wanted to say a couple words about uh, the personal journey spiritual journey this uh, was always one of my favorite things to hear uh, people in the congregation talk about their spiritual development. And, uh, and I had done one earlier that was more about my art. And this was the idea of a spiritual journey. And I, um, it brought all kinds of questions to mind. And I, uh, I was really happy to be able to do it. it, and I'm glad I did it at a time when I was able to devote quite a bit of time to writing, rewriting. And in the end, you're only you're only making a story because it isn't uh, like Nancy's poem said. You know, you look back and and whatever your memories are uh, are different from the time you lived, and and uh, you can never really bring that back. But it's interesting to try to uh, look at values, things you learned, and try to come up with a story. So here's a story. <clears throat> I was a curious child, the oldest of five children, born and raised in Wabash, a once prosperous northern Indiana town on the Wabash River. My dad was a captain of the fire department who had piloted bombers during the war. <clears throat> Mom was and still is a loving mother who was quite creative and encouraged her children in drawing, painting, and making things. I loved nature and spent as much time as possible hiking the fields and woodlands with friends or with my dog. A favorite destination was Shanty Falls. Above the falls, you could find flint chips and partial arrowheads, evidence of the site of a prehistoric village. And I'd like to, I was always drawn to that idea that people have been there so much longer than, than us white folks were. Church was a regular, but not a constant presence in my life. Mom taught Sunday school off and on. Her faith has always been important to her. She also taught Cub Scouts and I was in both Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. I achieved Life Scout and earned the God and Country Award. <clears throat> Mom took me to hear church-sponsored missionaries just back from their mission in Africa. I heard them say the people they worked with had no word for love. This, this struck me as preposterous. Even though I was fairly young, I suspected their belief gave them a sense of superiority. This might have been the point I became interested in the idea of equality and wanted to find out more about race. You could not escape our nation's obsession with race. Civil rights protests were on the news. I heard of local families knowing their place and wondered what that place might be. 
many casual remarks painted a picture of people who were less than whites. I, I wanted to understand this issue from both sides, but a near absence of black families in Wabash made this difficult. My high school years were in the mid-60s. The British invasion was in full swing, and the Vietnam War was heating up. A prescient English teacher handed me two books in the library. One was Happenings, a book about current, a current form of performance art, and the other was 19th century American utopian communities. I knew no, nothing of either subject. I took no art in high school. How did she know both su subjects would be of great interest to me? Our civics class teacher sponsored a Back Our Boys in Vietnam demonstration in front of the school. I attended. A year or two later, I would start attending more demonstrations. While I still supported our boys, I had turned sharply against the war. College was, as it is for most young people, a time of per personal differentiation. I declared myself an English major, or excuse me, an education major. In the dorm, I expanded the sort of people I knew. My neighbors were hippies from a big Indianapolis high school. I attached myself to two black freshmen from Gary. I remember at least two all-nighters, or maybe it was one all-nighter, and anyway, some other conversations, in their room talking about race. If they had ever had the experience of explaining themselves to white boys from small towns, they must not have tired of it yet. They were patient with me and told me stories about gang turf, walking many blocks out of their way to and from school, getting white hate stares, and getting picked up by the police. They did not return for second semester. I was sorry not to see them again, but I was grateful for their brief friendship as lopsided as it was. My sophomore year, I joined the anti-war movement, canvassing and going to protests in Indiana, Indiana and Washington, D.C. Jimi Hendrix, Cream, Jefferson Airplane were playing. I took my first art elective, two-dimensional design, and discovered I had a knack for it. By the end of the year, I was an art ed education minor. By the following year, I was majoring in art education and with a minor in psychology. My junior year, I walked into the ceramics room for the first time. The smell took me back to elementary school, where each year a young teacher had brought us a small ball of clay to work with, returning, later, returning it later as a fired object. I remember each clay project I did then. I knew I'd come into a special place for me. I went to a protest in D.C. I was hanging out with a charismatic anti-war priest and a bunch of Catholic kids. I joined the John Brown Society, which didn't do much beyond throwing a party or two and supporting the Black Student Union on an issue of de facto segregation in Muncie. That year, I became friends with my student teaching supervisor and her husband. Both were, besides teaching, they lived lives of actual artists, which was I was unfamiliar with. They built things, had a dark room and a pottery studio. We'd get together and draw and do, and do light shows. I began seeing myself as an artist. My senior year, I hung out in the art building a lot and, talk, and took my art classes much more seriously. I went to Washington, <clears throat> Washington for the moratorium protest. I became familiar with Unitarian Universal Service Committee in their anti-war and draft counseling work. I applied for conscientious objector status, <clears throat> not through the USC. I wrote a rambling statement to the draft board about the war and my beliefs, and met with them in Wabash. I didn't blame them when they turned me down. The requirements were strict, and I hadn't even tried to meet them. That year, the government issued the draft lottery. My number did not come up, so I never had to face the question that so many young men did.
It was an angry, creative, hopeful time. Progressive rock was peaking. I read Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, Black Elk Speaks, and Be Here Now, a popular book about Hinduism and cosmic consciousness. I took a free university class called Mania on thinking madness with readings about the outer limits of the human mind. Without going into specific details, I need to mention psychedelic drugs. There were a lot of drugs available in the 60s and 70s, probably less than there are now, but it seemed new at the time. Some were recreational, but there was a lot of literature, talk and song about expanding your mind. Aldous Huxley spoke of opening the doors of perception. Psychedelics were chemicals that did not stimulate or depress, but rather triggered an altered state of consciousness, often with visual, auditory, or perceptual changes. The experiences, though intense, were temporary, but after the experience, one knew one had seen other ways of the mind to perceive what was what so-called stray society had no understanding of. I shared an active interest in this subject through my 20s. I taught elementary art for a year after graduating and joined the Ananda Marga Society, an international group promoting yoga and mantra meditation. Yoga and meditation were traditional ways to practice consciousness raising and to promote physical health. At age 24, I quit teaching, helped start Sun Eye Pottery, and began years of making pots and art and trying to sell them. I made an 18-foot 18 18-foot 18 Sioux Crow teepee from scratch and started building sweat lodges. A friend organized a week-long mindfulness, mindfulness meditation retreat led by a Selenese Theravadan Buddhist monk in our pottery's big barn. Nancy remembers that retreat. Another time, hitchhiking back from a visit to my hometown, nightfall caught me in Bloomington. I called friends to come get me while wait and while waiting, went to a place called the ashram where they practiced Kundalini Yoga. By the way, I knew nothing of Kundalini Yoga except for the term. I was told to go to a large room where folks were finishing supper and listening to a talk. I found an empty spot and sat cross-legged at the end of Michael Schumacher's couch, listening to him talk about yoga and Kundalini energy. Most of the terms were familiar. However, I was a little disquieted when I noticed individuals in the room who seemed to be going rigid, some falling over. My curiosity won out eventually, and Michael looked at me and said, you asked for it. An intense rush of energy rolled up my spine and over my head. I lost sense of time. I looked at my watch. It was time to go. I said, thank you. Thank you. As I walked out, flashes of intense color were highlighting objects in my vision. Afterward, in a blissful afterglow, I thought I would return to the ashram and study Kundalini with Michael. But friends from Bloomington warned me off. I left the pottery, and Nancy and I moved into an old log cabin together. We rented Dunnerman Hill for $15 a month for two years. Eventually, I became restless and felt constricted by rural southern Indiana. I decided to take a hitchhiking trip, seeking a new direction. I sold my potter's wheel for cash, I think very little cash, and left with a destination. But upon arrival, found the place had suffered a fire. A young couple sent me to Taos, to Taos up the road, an art and gallery town, where I met an artist who said, I must go to the Taos Pueblo. 
in the traditional Pueblo, a Tiwa man, on his roof, invited me into one, his one-room adobe home, where I met his wife and three kids. They shared their supper and their floor for the night. A tribal elder brought him a half dozen handmade arrows for a big rabbit hunt the next day. He invited me to go too, but I declined. I think things were getting a little too intense for me. In the morning, I was picked up by a driver going to the Lama Foundation, the Colorado Commune that had published the Ram Das book, Be Here Now. The next morning, I was picked up by potters and taken to the National Council for Education and the Ceramic Arts Conference in Greeley, Colorado. Their comment was, we thought you looked like a potter. Finally, I was picked up by a Boy Scout leader who had organized a scout troop that demonstrated Native American dances, a group I had seen perform in Warsaw and loved several years before, many years before, actually. The principle here is, seek and ye shall find. An open seeking heart, supported by a minimum of routine, expectation, or social obligation, will find open doors. I was efficiently led on a feast for my soul, despite or because of the fact that I had no car, very little money, no roof, and no firm plans. I imagine sincere prayer works in a similar way. In 1978, I returned to Ball State to get my master's degree. Nancy and I were married at the Peace and Life Studies Center outside Muncie. Our daughter Emily was born that winter. After Emily's birth, my ceramics mentor looked at me and said, your life will never be the same. And he was right. Our new family became our primary focus. During our time at Ball State, Nancy's copy of the National Geographic arrived. In it was an article about Columbus, Indiana. One picture showed an elementary school library with bright banners and a slide. Nancy wondered if I would like to teach there. After getting my MA degree in sculpture and ceramics, we found work in Columbus in the school that was depicted in the National Geographic article. By the way, that was Fadria, and that's another story. This was another synchronistic event that some people would say was just coincidence, but I insist was something more meaningful. I had read an old book by Horatio Greeno, an early American sculptor, who wrote about his theory that the built environment has an effect upon those who inhabit it. He insisted that the United States pay particular attention to the design and construction of Washington, D.C., then being built, so that it would have a salutary effect upon all of our legislators. And see how that worked. Columbus was a town where such a social experiment was, take, was being conducted, and I was happy to be part of it. We, we rented for a few years and then purchased the property we live on now. Dylan was born seven years after Emily. Life took on a more measured pace with jobs, bills, property upkeep, and time with family and friends. I've long since given up any quest for nirvana, cessation of suffering, transcendence, or merging with the Tao. I meditate a little, I still maintain a sense of what some would call mysticism. I see the natural world as a constantly shifting field of energy. I believe our thoughts are somehow connected to that field. I believe love is our most powerful positive force. I think these principles are currently outside of science because they are hard to measure. But these principles are not apart from nature, nor unknown to many religions. I believe I do have a form of faith. I'm not sure where it comes from. It isn't earned. It isn't a faith in a personal God, but in a magnificent universe of order and chaos where creation, life, and love struggle against the forces of entropy. My art is my spiritual practice. 
I am in awe of the whole mysterious natural world and revere its forms and infinite interconnections. My art is an attempt to translate some of my awe and reverence into physical form. Just as long as you stand, stand by me. 